Hello viewers, tonight I'm going to be reading some Pulp Fiction. Now, some of you may not know what Pulp Fiction is. Um, I have talked about it before with a few viewers of this channel in some of my conversations about comic books and manga. Um, I've talked about the precursor to comic books, which were Pulp Fiction magazines. They were short stories in a... They were basically... It was basically a magazine that had a good deal of short stories in them. Expertly written, very well written, better than most novels in terms of writing, and far more entertaining. Um, the talent of the writers was simply incredible, to be entirely honest. Um, here, there was some art. It was very, very, um, the art is what you, it isn't as, um, skillfully done as in most comic books or manga or whatnot. But in a pop fiction magazine, the point of reading the magazine was not about the art, it was about the story and the writing. Um, pop fiction magazines as a medium of art were good more, how should it be said, intellectual, so to speak. They... They... Um, they have a few pictures in, in most of them. Some of them do not have very many pictures, but in, in this precursor to comic books and this time when many people did not have televisions, pop fiction magazines were a good form of entertainment for, for most people. Um, and we will be reading um, Thorpe McCluskey's The Crawling Horror give those of you who are unfamiliar with Pulp Fiction an idea of what Pulp Fiction is. Now, truth be told, I did say this in my one of my previous videos, which I will, which I will be uploading um, very soon, hopefully, that my internet is down, so I'm basically making videos with certain PDF files that I would like to talk about. Um, so, um, this will be a new experience to some of you, or maybe some of you have actually read some Pulp Fiction and you know what what this is. And it is interesting. This this magazine was thirty five cents. I doubt any of us can find anything for 35 cents in this day and age. Um, now, the Avon Fantasy Reader is not one of the most popular Pulp Fiction magazines. I do believe the most popular one was a, a magazine called Weird Tales. Now, um, the Avon Fantasy Reader is sort of a compilation of different stories from different pop fact, pont, pop excuse me, fantasy publications. Now, just as in my manga readings, I will be... Um, how should I say this? Be narrating and giving commentary. And if I need to use the dictionary, some of these... Um, the, the quality of writing is a great deal more impressive than what is in most manga, so maybe I will need to check the dictionary at times so that I can um, so that I can know what some of these words mean and then, and also help some of you read this. And at some point I would be doing a video wherein I do show you how to acquire these particular magazines. In PDF format, there is also a type of comic format the person can also use, but I really do not see the point. I do think that, as far as I am concerned, 
um, the PDF format is per adventure the best to use. Let's see. Exit full screen for now. Because I'm trying to I am trying to get this as big as I can. Alright. Let me take a look at this. Full screen. Alright, it, it is now on full screen. Which is good. You can see it a lot better. Alright. This is The Crawling Horror by Thorpe McCluskey. One day I will talk more about these authors. Truth be told. There is so much you can do with PDF files. They're absolutely amazing. Anyhow, without further ado, I will begin. I'm about to set down on paper a sequence of indisputable happenings. At some of the incidents I was personally present, and the story of the others has come to me through the testimony of impe unimpeachable and trustworthy witnesses. I'm a country physician, having practiced in this village, in this single village, all my life, as indeed my father did before me. The people here are farmers, mostly of Dutch or German descent, with a few Poles and Lithu Lith Lithuanians. Oh my goodness. I have always had a very big problem pronouncing Lith Lithuania. Lith All right. Anyhow, I struggled and, and did it, so that is fine. About two miles beyond this vi the village, Hans Ludwig Brudbaker had his farm. The farm is still there, and it is worked by relatives. But Han has gone. No one definitely knows where or what he is. We can only guess. Hans lived there alone. His mother outlived Brubaker, senior, died in 1929 or 1930, and Hans was left by himself. The village naturally assumed that... Um, one moment, I'd like to talk about the fact that it is indeed true that these magazines are very old, from the 19, early 1900s, especially the 30s. They were extremely popular. Not everyone had a television, and so reading was very important back then. It was an incredible medium of entertainment. Very interesting. Anyhow, and Hans was left by himself. The village naturally assumed that he would presently marry, but for some obscure reason he did not, although he showed a decided preference for one young woman. Now, there is no way of definitely, definitely knowing just when the strange progression of events, at first of seeming unimportance, began, but with the whole story complete, although I cannot say when it began, I can tell how it began. I know that during the first months, Hans did not suspect anything out of the ordinary. Obviously, he misunderstood and so ignored the small beginnings which led slowly, step by step, toward horror. He told me possibly three months ago how it began. I thought the rats were fighting at first, he explained, with the uneasy, depre deprecatory laugh of the person who does not believe, not expect to be believed. There was a powerful lot of rats about the place. Oh, um, also I probably do not need to say this, but this is a horror story. It, it is supposed to be scary, people. Um, there was a powerful lot of rats about the place. The cats kept them down somewhat, but there always seemed to be more growing up, scratching and squeaking in the walls. But the idea of their fighting, I remember thinking that there must be one awful big fellow in there somewhere. I could hear him scuffle and then plop. Down he would come off a cross beam between the walls, soft and heavy like, and the cats heard him too. I watched them for a few weeks snooping around at side it like heard that big fellow go plop every once in a while listen to the squeaking and running in the walls that seemed somehow scared the idea got in my head that the big one was a killer 
he was, too. That, that's, that's not a doubt of it. Whenever he was in one place, the rest were elsewhere. The mice began to desert the house for the barn. My cats got quite a number of them that way, along about. Then, a strange thing happened. One day I noticed a cat hanging around. White she was and pretty. She stayed around the porch while I was feeding my own cats, and I tried to pet her and feed her, but she wouldn't come near me, and she wouldn't eat. Seemed interested only in Peter, a big tiger cat of mine. Well, that was natural, even if it did seem funny that she wouldn't eat. Peter watched her some, and that night he stayed out. He never came back, and I never heard the big rat from that night on in the walls again. You know how cats are around the farm? They're on their keep, and they're good company. I always had seven or eight, sometimes as many as a dozen of them. And my cats began to disappear one by one. In two weeks there were only a couple left. I couldn't understand it. I remember that I began to think somebody was poisoning them. The two that were left looked sick and scared, too, as if they knew something was wrong, and then one day they went away and never came back. Even then I didn't have any suspicions that came near the truth, and for quite a while after that I didn't notice anything. And it began again, but it began again. This night was colder, I remember. It must have been around the 1st of November. I had a shunk fire going. It was evening, and I was sitting with my feet in the oven. My shoes were on the floor on the left side of the share. A big Morris share that, that's in the kitchen. The fire was nice and warm. The doors were all shut, and I was smoking my pipe. The house was still as deaf. One of my two collie dogs was outside somewhere, and the other one, Non, was lying close to the stove at my right, a foot or so from my chair, soaking in the warmth, sleeping. It must have been about half past nine. It certainly wasn't later than that. I enjoy that last hour or so before I get into bed. Everything is done for the day. And I can lie back and rust and think. I had everything arranged for solid comfort. The share back was set just right and my pipe was going good. Looking back now and trying to remember, I must have dosed off for a few minutes. I forget whether I put my pipe out or not. Maybe it just hung loose in my left hand and went out of itself. Anyway, I found it on the floor beside the stove afterward. Yes, I was probably just sleeping with the pipe dangling in my hand. My right arm was hanging from the sheer arm, limp-like, and as I began to come out of that little snooze, I reached down to stroke the dog, but as I came awake, I realized that something was queer about that thing under my hand beside the share. It didn't feel like a dog's neck, like a dog's back. It was the right distance from the floor, but it was slippery, and there wasn't any hair on it. My hand kept moving, but right off I knew that whatever I was petting, it wasn't any dog. I had the idea that if I pressed my hand down, I could push my fingers right into it. All this took a lot less time than in the telling. Maybe three or four seconds I began to be scared. I turned to look, and God knows what I expected to see. Certainly nothing like what was there. It was a slimy sort of stuff, transparent looking, without any shape to it. It looked as though if you picked it up, it would drip right in, right through your fingers. And it was alive. I don't know how I knew that, but I was sure of it even before I looked. It was alive. 
and a sort of shapeless arm of it lay across the dog's back and covered her head. She didn't move. I guess I yelled. Then, Dr. Kurt and I jumped off the chair and reached for the poker. That slimy thing hadn't moved, but... And some of you, I will... Excuse me. Some of you may not know what a poker is because some of you, per adventure, have never lived in the house with a wood stove. However, a poker is one of those things that you use um, to basically move firewood in the stove or a fireplace. All right. That slimy thing hadn't moved, but I knew if it wanted to, it could move like lightning. It was heavy looking too. I remember thinking that it must have weighed about 50 pounds. I hit at the thing with a poker. And as quick as I as thought, the whole mess started, sliding across the floor, stretching out as worms do, oozing under the crack beneath the door that leads onto the porch. Before I knew it, the thing was gone. I looked at Nan. She hadn't moved, and she seemed asleep. I shook her until she opened her eyes, and her eyes looked dead. Well, Dr. Kurt, you'll believe me when I tell you that I didn't sleep that night. I caught myself listening for noises. Not that I knew what to listen for, except the sound of that thing sliding back into the house again, for I remember that it could go through a crack. If I looked once around that kitchen, everywhere, I looked a hundred times. Pig didn't come back at all night. Peg didn't come back all night. Excuse me. That was strange. Because she usually stayed right around, around close. It was just as though she was afraid. As it was just getting light, Peg came up on the porch. I was glad to hear her, and I let her in quick. Then I saw Nan. She made some funny sort of howling noise, and her ears dropped flat against her head. Then she went for Nan. Froth beginning to run from her mouth. It was just as though, although she was trying to kill Nan, she was definitely afraid. It wasn't pretty to see. Nan didn't fight back. She just lay there, as though she didn't see what it was. As though Peg, as though, oh, excuse me. I do believe I have messed up. As though she didn't know enough to try and fight or run. If I hadn't dragged Peg off... Um, I'm just looking... Okay, I can see my arrow. Excuse me. <laughs> off. Nan would have been dead in another minute. And even after I had put Peg outdoors, Nan didn't move much. She just shuddered a little, and she didn't even look at the places where the blood was running down. I had to shoot her then. It made me sick to do it, and I dragged her out off the porch, off the b back porch, and went to the barn to do the milking. I didn't eat any breakfast. I felt sick to the stomach. After I had finished the shores around the barn, I got a shovel and went back to the house. Nan's body was gone. There wasn't a sign of her. And a bone of a patch of hair. Nothing but a clean, scuffed place in the grass. At first I thought I might have made a mistake. Maybe I'd left her around the other side of the house, but I went around to the front porch and Nan was nowhere. The funny thing, Dr. Kurt, is that somehow I knew that it would happen just like it did. I didn't say anything to anybody then. I just watched and waited, and a few wa weeks later, I saw the dog that looked like Nan, Dr. Kurt. It was Nan, yet it wasn't. I saw her hanging around the barnyard, and I whistled to her absent-minded, and then I remembered that Nan was dead, but it looked like Nan, and I knew that it was waiting for Pig to come out. I knew that it wasn't Nan, Dr. Kurt, because it didn't come when I whistled. Two or three times that week, I saw that dog that looked like Nan, and it wasn't Nan, hanging around 
and each time she looked thinner and weaker. And then, after a few days, I didn't see her anymore. She had just gone away. For two weeks nothing happened, then one day I spotted a strange dog, a big dog hanging around, and that night Peg vanished. She never came back. You can see how it was, Dr. Kurt. I began to see a sort of pattern Fur to it. First the mouse, then first the mice, then the cats, then the dogs. I got to wondering if it could it would get the cattle next or maybe the people. Abruptly, Hans paused. I think that then I carried it off perf perfectly. I did not utter a word, but merely waited impassively. Whatever I did or omitted to do, it gave Hans confidence, for after a moment he went on. Dr. Kurt, as sure as I'm sitting here, it's gone from animals to humans. Humans? I asked. Hans nodded. It's happened, he said softly. One afternoon, three weeks ago, I was standing in the yard, you know that, along, about then, we were having stiff frosts every morning and night. I saw the strange boy coming down the road. I may have said this a bit differently than I should have, because this is a question mark. You know that long about, then we were having stiff frost every morning and night? Okay, that's a question, question mark. I'm so sorry, people. Very interesting. Okay. Um, he wasn't more than 12 or 13 years old, and he was wearing odds and ends of clothes that looked as though he had picked them up anywhere. I looked at him, and right away I knew that he was a runaway, the kid, as he walked along, kept looking at the house as if he had uh, half a mind to stop, but he didn't stop. Just went on past. Slowly looking back from time to time, I went down the driveway, and I almost called out to him, but I didn't. It was as if something inside me said, don't call, that thing you see there isn't a boy, it's deaf in the shape of a boy. That's what I seemed to think, Dr. Kurt. I was scared. And ashamed, too. I was so ashamed that I went right down to the road of the idea of yelling at the boy. And I happened to look down at my feet. You know, I told you that there had been a frost, Dr. Kurt. It was cold enough all night to form good solid ice, and there had been a thaw for a couple of days beforehand. Well, that slushy stuff in the road had frozen, not hard enough to hold a horse or a cow, but plenty hard enough to hold a fairly heavy man, because when I walked on it, it didn't crack or break except once in every five or six steps, but where that kid had walk, walked, walked. The ice was broken at every step, and he looked to weigh not more than half what I do. I looked at those tracks in the frozen slush, Dr. Kurt, and then I turned around and walked to the house. I knew then that the thing had come back. Maybe my house is home to it. Maybe because it began in my house, it likes to come back. I wanted to tell then, but I didn't dare. I was afraid people would laugh, but I'm going to tell now because two days ago the Peterson kid disappeared and he hasn't come back. Um, okay, let me um, get my place back. I sort of got off focus. Very sorry, people. Okay, I'm right here. And what's more... He'll never come back. He's part of that thing that began on my walls with the rats. Hans stopped speaking. I knew that there was nothing more for him to tell. The room was oddly silent. Presently he asked, What can be done about it? 
I didn't know what to say, but I felt that I should say something, should try at least, to quiet the man's nerves. Go home, I advised at last, gently, get a good night's sleep and come back tomorrow. I have thought it over by then. That night, I sat up late. I sat up late, pondering the, haunt, the story Hans had told me. Perhaps at that time I almost believed him. And in the morning, as I had expected, he returned. It all looked much more impossible in the bright light of mid-morning than it had looked the evening before. I grasped at the idea that Although something extremely strange might be going on, yet the explanation might come presently of itself in a purely matter-of-fact manner. In effect, that is what I told Brewbreaker. Hans went away disappointed, almost angry, and not more than twenty minutes after he left my office, Hilda Lang came in. She seemed extraordinarily perturbed. Dr. Kurt, she began abruptly, do you think that Hans is crazy? Why do you ask? I returned. Talking with her was different from talking with Hans. She was a beautiful young woman, tall, long-waisted, slender-limbed, with fair blue eyes and yellow hair and gloriously clear skin. There was something imperiously demanding about her that disturbed me. She looked at me then she made a curious, impatient gesture. Oh, don't pretend. You know that Hans came to you yesterday with a story. He has told me the same things that he told you, Dr. Kurt. You know about all of this. Do you think he is crazy? I shook my head. Don't worry on that account, Hilda. Hans is not crazy. He may be fooled. He may even, even be fooling himself, but he is sane. Hilda sighed in relief. Thank God for that. I was worried. Then as a sudden new thought struck her, she leaned forward tensely. But if he is sane, his story is true. She paused. I said nothing. I'm going to marry him, she said abruptly. He's been afraid of this thing long enough. If there's nothing to it, it shouldn't keep us apart. And if he's in danger, two people in that lonely house are better than one. I waited a long time while the room hung silent before I replied, You believe in this danger then? I asked. Yes, I believe in it. As I believe in Hans, I believe in it. And in a little while she went away. For the rest of the week, I went about my usual routine. Hans, of course, did not come back, but I learned that he suddenly married Hilda and that they were living at the Brubaker farm. A day or two later, I drove out to see them. Hans was working about the back of the house as I drove into the yard. He straightened slowly, put down the tools from his hands, and walked over to the car. He looked tired, as though he had not been sleeping well. Shutting off the motor, I climbed from the car. Then, while I was close to him, Hans whispered hoarsely, There is much danger here. Dr. Kurt, I can feel it. I watch every night, Doctor. I've seen things that I haven't told her about. I can't tell her. I want to sell the place and go away, where it's safe. But Hilda laughs. She hasn't seen the things I've seen. Just what have you seen? I asked. He looked at me eagerly. Come to the house tonight after Hilda has gone to bed, he whispered. I nodded. Then, we were at the kitchen door and there was Hilda, smiling, beautiful in her tall, strong fairness, walking me, welcoming me to her home. That night at 11 o'clock, I returned to the rutted road that led to the Brubaker farm. It was abysmally dark, but it was not cold. I remember thinking that it might snow before morning. Long before I reached at Brubaker's, I could see two tiny yellow lights at the back of the house, at the, the kitchen and the back room. I drove past the house a hundred yards. 
parked a car along the side of the road. Alongside the road. And returned to the house on foot. I did not look at my watch. So, I did not know how long I stood outside the driveway. Waiting like that seems intermittable. I know. And obviously, I could not come in until Helda was asleep. At last, both lights were put out, almost simultaneously, and in a few minutes, as I had expected, the light in the kitchen flared up again. I walked softly to the rear door and knocked. Hans let me in immediately. I stepped into the kitchen, my eyes slightly dazzled by the brilliance within, and it was not until I had been comfortably seated beside the table that I noticed with a start what Hans was doing. He was sealing the bedroom door off from the kitchen with wax, making the passageway between the two rooms hermetically tight. He worked with the rapidity of one who, is, who does a task he's performed before. Presently, he had sealed the door in its entirety. Then, he put the remaining mass of wax in a piece of brown paper and carefully hid it way behind the wood box in the corner. He came across the room and sat down beside me. We talked in whispers. I'm learning all the time what the thing can do, he told me. It came back three days ago, but I'm tired. Tired to death. I haven't slept. I looked at him, at the reddish bloodshot color in his, of his eyes, at his sunken sheep, cheeks. Why don't you sleep now, I suggested. I'll watch. He looked at me eagerly. You're safe. It, it can't come in unless you're asleep or unless you invite it in. I've learned that. But if anything happens, wake me. I nodded. It'll be all right. Don't worry. Exhausted, he lay back and closed his eyes. He fell asleep almost at once. Outside, it had begun to snow. The soft, heavy flakes made a steady rustling against the window. I looked out curiously. I noticed that the window had been nailed shut. And the crevices stuffed with putty and painted over. I went inside impulsively and looked at the bedroom windows. They, too, were nailed and putted tight. And I saw that the whole back end of the house had been freshly painted. He's got the those two rooms air tight and water tight. All right, I thought. Back in the kitchen again, I remembered uneasily that I was supposed to be on watch. But nothing had happened. Hans still slept. The fire still burned softly and s the snow drifted and fell away from the black window pane. And then, abruptly, as a flash of lightning striking into the room, the whole calmness with which I had surrounded myself, my whole sense of security vanished as though it had never been. Not that there was any physical happening. There was nothing in that sense. But there was a sudden sweeping realization that some mighty malignant force turned its whole attention upon the house. I sat up sharply and walked to the door where I stood listening. There was no sound from outside. And the snow, I could see out of the corner of my eye as I half glanced at the window was still falling steadily I waited perhaps five minutes and still that terrible awareness of some horrible force overhanging impeding persisted then I threw the door wide open and stepped out upon the back porch was nothing there. 
I turned back into the kitchen, and then I saw fleetingly something move at the window, at the kitchen window. The window was beyond the table, beyond the light, beyond Hans' sleeping figure. It was grayish, with the constant touching of fingers of snow. And it seemed to me that for a second I saw something slipping down the window pane. Something that clung to the plane, pane like a colorless jelly, almost like a wave of watery foam, almost like a nothingness that moved heavily down the window pane and disappeared below the sill. The thought or vision, whatever it was, was fragmentary. I remember that I thought, even as I crossed, the floor toward the window to look out. Oh, excuse me, people. I'm going to move this mouse that I have. Um, okay, one second. Oftentimes, it's somewhat difficult for me to hold a microphone in my hand and have my mouse in the other hand, and I have to sort of get comfortable. So very sorry for that. Um... One moment. All right. Um, I think I am ready now. Okay. Um, yes. That moved heavily down the window pane and disappeared below the sill. The glimpse of vision, whatever it was, was fragmentary. I remember that I thought, even as I crossed the floor toward the window to look out, that it might well be an illusion, but when I reached the window, I paused stock still, pondering. And stock still is a word that means completely still. Um, if some of you didn't know, the snow hadn't been had been wiped clearly from the sill, better than it could have been with a broom been done with a broom. And I realized that here was, at last, was evidence, physical evidence, that something had pressed down upon the sill a few moments ago. For I could feel, for I could yet count the flakes as they fell thickly upon the still bare wood, my lips moving unconsciously I, while I uttered soundless words. I stood there watching the snow fall, rustling upon the sill, until the wood was again unbrokenly sheathed and with white. Something had swept that snow away. I went outdoors again and stood again, outside the window, in the snow. I looked down, and at my feet the snow had been packed down, and leading away from the house for a short distance, I saw a sharply marked track, like the trail that might be made by rolling a large bar, ball. And beyond the rectangle of light that the window loosed in the snow-ridden room, snow-ridden gloom, I mean, that track became a trail of human footprints. Then my courage deserted me. Only one thought remained in my mind, to get back into that house as fast as I could. I got back into the kitchen at once. Hans was awake. The cold air from the open door had roused him. He looked at me, at first uncomprehendingly, then, then alertedly. And I saw he knew pretty well what had happened. He sat up, stretching. St muscle stiff from sleeping half erect in the chair. Did someone come to the door, he asked. I shook my head, pointing to the window. There was a sort of gray fog against the window. It lasted only a moment. I went, in, I went outside. There are tracks in the snow. Hans looked at me queerly. Tracks like nothing on earth are human tracks. My voice was harsh and high-pitched as I answered, Tracks like both. As the day slowly lightened, 
Hans stripped the molding of wax from the bedroom door, shaped it between his hands, and affixed it to the lump behind the wood box. I left the house before Hilda awoke and returned to the village. In twilight, I drove my car again into the Brubaker yard and walked to the house, grayish, apprehensive seeming in the falling darkness. Entering the house, I realized at once that Hans had told Hilda everything, stamped on the faces engraved in both of both the in, in the speech, excuse me, in the speech of both man and woman was a determination to fight the thing that threatened their home. Hilda, brave girl, brought out a panoch, panochly, panochly deck. Okay, this is a type of card game. This is the type. This is a type of card game, people. For those of you who don't know, you do it with playing cards. Um, I do not know how to pronounce it. I do not know if that is panak, panakle, or panosle, or panokle. <laughs> um, maybe some of you do know how to pronounce that, but I do not. I do not know how to pronounce that. I am very sorry, but I did not know how to pronounce that. Some of you may know what this game is and what this word is. If you do, please tell me in the comments section if, if you know how to pronounce that. Okay? Interesting. But before we could sit down to play, there was an interruption. A car turned into the driveway, pulled up beside the house, and a farmer came in. A man named Bront who lived nearby, he shook his head when Hans asked him to sit down. My Bertha, he stammered eagerly. Have you seen anything of her? I felt a tingle of fear. She's gone. She's run away. She's been going around too much with that Irish Catholic Fagin. I put my foot down. I run away, Papa, she told me. And now she's done it. She's gone. Did she walk to town? Two miles? It's a bad night out, Hilda said doubtfully. I think that if you inquire at the houses along the road, you'll probably find her, I said. Presently the man went out. Do you think it was that? Hans asked. When he had gone, I shook my head. It was perfectly plain what had happened. We began to play Pinocchio or Pinoc. I am very, it is very hard for me to say this word because I did not know if the CH is sh or k or if, I guess since it's not a K, Panach, Panochle or P, P, I completely mess that word up. I really do. <laughs> I know I'm saying it wrong. And nothing out of the ordinary occurred. The malignant influence seemed to have departed the vicinity. The house seemed more than usually cozy and peaceful. And from time to time, I caught myself wondering if, after all, I might not be acting like a fool. The next night also nothing happened. Hans, with his first-hand knowledge of the thing, suggested that he that it had fed elsewhere and that there would be a quiet a quiescent period and feeling that I was neglecting my practice I stayed away from the farm for a few days but late Saturday afternoon I found a note from Hans it has come back he had written after supper I took my I took my car and drove out to the Brubaker farm there had been a heavy thaw, which had held on for several days. The roads were mere ribbons of mud and dirty ice. Both husband and wife looked inhumanly tired. I noticed that Hans hadn't sh had not shaved for two or three days. We didn't want to trouble you, he told me. We, we've slept a little in the daytime, taking turns, but... Even in the days we can feel the thing near the house, and we're deathly tired. Sit quietly and don't speak, Hilda said softly, and you will feel it. 
I sat as she had asked, and striking inward at me I could sense the same crawling horror that I had known before. I looked at the others. Yes, I can feel it. But Hans, Hilda, you're utterly exhausted. Lie down now and rest. I'll watch. Hans nodded eagerly toward Hilda. Lie down and try to sleep, darling. Dr. Kurt will sit up with me. It will be safe. Hilda uncertainly went into the bedroom. I poured half a tumble full of brandy, diluted it with water, and made Hans drain the glass. The liquor seemed to strengthen him, and I talked. We can beat this thing in two rays, Hans. We know that it is a mass of dead, alive cells controlled by a deathless, malign entity. The Slavic people had the right idea when they, as they thought, trapped Slavic um, peoples, or Russian, Ukrainian, a few different types of peoples. Um, if some of you didn't know, most of you I'm sure do know though. I, but who knows? There are so many different... Um, there are some people who are not familiar with the word Slavic. When they, as they thought, trapped vampires in their coffins and drove stakes through their hearts and sealed the coffins. What they did not truly realize was the nature of the being they combated. Because the thing itself, because the thing is half physical, it has, to, to an extent, physical limitations. It must sleep. And what, in effect, those old-timers did was to catch their vampire sleep and seal it in the, in the box, which, unfortunately, which fortunately happened to be strong enough to resist its physical strength. The stake through the heart meant nothing. It was the airtight, solid coffin that did the business, restrained the thing, restrained the thing until, as its physical substance slowly died, so was its spirit rendered homeless. Now we know that this entity is strongly attached to this particular vicinity. In the course of time, it will find a permanent place where it can sleep. A barrel, perhaps, or a cistern, or an old trunk, or even a casket, if there's such a thing available. And if we can find that hiding place, and while the thing is within, Seal its receptacle, hermetically tight, we will have beaten it. There is yet another way to beat the thing, Hans. That is for someone to invite it to absorb him, if it can. The entity will try, Hans, for it knows nothing, to f nothing of fear. Then if the man's will is greater, the man will win. Otherwise, the thing will absorb him, continue to grow, and he will cease to exist. Hans' eyes were closed. But when I stopped speaking, he roused himself enough to mutter, I'm falling asleep. Then his head drooped forward heavily. Leisurely, I opened the book and began to read. A night of wakefulness lay ahead. The hours slo slipped slowly by. I could hear Hilda through the half-opened bedroom door Breathing slowly and deeply, Hans beside me snored irregularly. It was close to three when I heard footsteps sloshing up the driveway, passing around behind the house, hesitating, slowly ascending the steps, then a knock. Looking back now, I think that at that moment I was horribly afraid. Even though a revolver lay on the table, and I clearly, and I certainly, had no lurking fear that the thing would walk up to the house just like that. My body shielded with fear, I opened the door, and then I exclaimed with relief, for outside on the porch, bedraggled with mud and slush, stood 18-year-old Bertha Brant. She wore a shapeless, dirty, unpressed coat. When she saw me, she shrank back, away from the door. Bertha, you poor kid, come in and dry out those ringing wet clothes and tell me what's wrong. I noticed that she looked curiously, curiously at Hans. 
There's been a sickness, I explained hurriedly. Nothing serious. Hans has been up two or three nights. I looked at her squarely. So you're back? She glanced at me timidly. You know, then, that I ran away? Yes, I knew. But here, sit down by the fire. To take off your coat. Suddenly, for some un unaccountable reason, I remember why I was at Brubaker's at three o'clock in the morning. I remembered all that Hans had told me about the strange white cat, about the dog that looked like Nan, about the boy who had wandered down the road. I laughed then at the, at the silliness of it. This is Bertha, all right, I told myself. She's the same girl she always was, as right as rain. Right as rain, except that she's a little tired. And almost aping my thought, Bertha said, Could I lie down beside Hilda? I daren't go home tonight. I daren't. I was pottering around the stove with my back turned toward the girl, trying to warm over some coffee. Lie down beside Hilda, I said absently. In a minute. In a minute. I went to the corner cupboard and found the cup and the saucer. And I poured out the coffee, doctored it plentifully with milk and sugar, and turned back to Bertha. She was not in the room. Bertha, I called softly. The crawling cold sensation had begun again at the base of my spine. To my inexpressible relief, her voice answered from the bedroom. Here, Dr. Kurt, I'm so tired. Come and get your coffee. Then you can lie down and rest. What you need now is food. I know, she answered slowly, but I'm so tired. You said that in a minute I could lie down with Hilda. It's been a minute. Just like a child, but I was impatient. You mustn't lie on Hilda's bed while you're all dirty. You have to wash first. There was a little pause, then the voice answered so, still softly. Hilda won't mind. Hilda's asleep. Hilda's sound asleep. I went to the doorway and stood there uncertainly, half in gloom, half in brightness. I could see the figures of the two women lying on the bed, close against each other. Almost, my imagination told me, melting together. Come, Bertha, I said mildly. You're, dirty, you're dirtying Hilda's bed. There was no answer. As my eyes became more accustomed to the dimness, I could see that there on the bed, there was no longer two women. The two bodies were pressing together like ghastly Siamese twins, dissolving together into one. My heart in that instant froze like a lump of ice. Somehow, my whole body trembling horribly. I leapt across the half-darkened room, knelt on the bed, and dug frenzied fingers into the thing that l had looked like Bertha, and that was now eating the sleeping woman, dissolving her as might a powerful, a powerful acid. My fingers beneath the muddy, tattered garments sank deep, not into the firm flesh of a living girl, but into a yielding mass of protoplasmic slime. Then I screamed. And as I fought and tore at the flaccid, jelly-like mess, I screamed again and again without pause, like a madman, without hearing my own voice, knowing only from the tauntness of my throat and the beating of my breath that I streaked. It was like trying to grasp something that would not be grasped. The stuff beneath the garments ran like water in a bag, and I saw that the thing was slowly giving up pretense of human shape. The face was clearly... The face was changing. Oh, excuse me, people. I have to see if... Okay, I am recording. I had to check and see if I was recording, just in case. The face was changing. The hands and arms and the contours of the body were dissolving, and in the last second before it melted into shapeless slime... From that vanishing mouth came Bertha Brandt's voice, crying. I didn't do it, Dr. Kurt. I didn't. Then the thing was only a mass of jelly, still clinging like some loathsome, colorless leech to Hilda's back and shoulders. My body shrinking. I crawled over it and through it, seized Hilda's arms and pulled her off 
the bed, onto the floor. And then I screamed again, for of Hilda there was left only a half of her body. Her spine lay bare, her, ri her ribs curved nakedly, her skull gaped, gaped. Her entrails drooped across the dingy carpet. It was like it was like a slaughterhouse in hell. Suddenly, the light streaming through the doorway dimmed, and I saw Hans standing there, the gun in his hand, and I saw, I saw the spurting red flames and heard the crash of firing. I saw the poppy mass on the bed and shiver as each slug tore through it. Then there was silence. Yet through the haze of smoke, I saw the, ma the mess of protoplasmic slime drip slowly off the bed and slide across the floor toward the horrible ruin that had once been a woman. And on my hands and knees, I tried to push it back, scooping at it as unconcernedly concernedly, the thing flowed across the floor between my fingers and again a fast fastened upon Hilda. Hans was kneeling beside me, but we couldn't keep the thing away from the dead woman. It was impossible. Then abruptly, Hans stood up. His face was ghastly white like the face of a dead man. Without a backward glance, he left the corpse with that awful thing still crawling over it and went out of the room into the kitchen. And there I saw him take a pat of wax from the wood box heat it over the fire, and methodically seal the crevices in the kitchen door, leading out onto the porch. When he had finished, he nodded grimly at me, made a wide gesture that included the kitchen and bedroom. A coffin, Dr. Curdy said slowly. I've made a coffin of these rooms and sealed the thing in it. When it is slime, it cannot escape. And when it, when it is in the shape of a human being, we can fight it, so that it cannot unlock the door. Then he came back into the bedroom, and slowly I followed. We had been in the kitchen only a few minutes, but in those minutes, the horror had finished this ghastly work. Nothing remained of Hilda. Only a bag of clothes lay there limply, and nestling in them glistened a great mound of watery, jelly-like stuff, fainting quiverly faintly quivering, alertly alive. Then I saw that Hans had brought matches and strips of newspaper. As I watched, he twisted the paper into spills, lit one, and plunged the flaming mass against the globule of colorless life on the floor. The mound of stuff quivered and writhed and slid swiftly across the floor as it sought, sought to escape, Hans, his eyes intent, stubbled jaws grim, followed it about the room, always keeping the blazing paper torches pressed against the shrinking, unholy thing. The air was becoming thick with the rancid smoke and the odor of burning flesh filled the room. Stumbling, sobbing, sobbing together we attacked the horror. Here and there on the floor and carpet showed brown, shard, smears the thing silent. Sliding attempts to escape were somehow more terrible if it had, than if it had cried out in agony. The smoke in the room had become a thick haze and then the thing seemed to gather purpose. It rolled swiftly across the bedroom floor, stopped upon the disheveled box pile of clothes that Hilda had worn, and as we paused to light fresh spills, it changed. It reared erect as a fountain might gush up. It put forth arms, developed breasts, overspread itself with color, and the time that it, had, it might take to draw a long breath, the thing had vanished, and a something that we knew to be that same ghastly entity, but that looked as Hilda had looked in life, stood naked there amid the jumbled clothes. Swiftly the entity, for I cannot call it by Hilda's name, stooped and drew about itself the skirt and blouse. Then barefooted and stockingless, it walked into the kitchen like a man awakening from drug slumber. Hans leaped before the door, held up 
by a blazing spill. The thing spoke, and the voice was the voice of Hilda. I want to go out, Hans. It moved forward slighting slightly. Hans' features racked, almost unrecognizable. Thrust the blazing paper before him menacingly. You'll never leave this house. We're going to burn you. The thing that looked and spoke like Hilda shook its head and I gasped to see the wavy, fine, blonde tresses undulate and tremor with the gesture, and it smiled. You'll never burn me, Hans. I'm a prisoner, Hans. You want to destroy the thing that holds me, but you don't want to burn me to death, Hans. For as yet, I haven't suffered except from your fire. I'm Hilda, Hans. Then Hans asked hoarsely, and I saw that the fire was burning his fingers. How can I know? The thing smiled. You can't know, Hans. But if you destroy me, Hilda suffers. Let me go. Then Hans shook his head. No. We will stay here until you starve, until you rot into nothingness, came the inexorable reply. As I suffer, Hilda suffers. As I starve, she starves. Hans looked at me, and I could see that he was nerving himself toward an incredibility. Then, by heaven, Dr. Kurt, I will try the other way. He looked at the entity, at the thing that looked like Hilda. Come, Hilda, he said simply. If you are a prisoner in that thing before me, hear me. I want to join you. I want to join you and Bertha and Nan and God only knows what other unfortunate creatures with souls who have been overcome. But I do not surrender and I cannot be beaten by guile. Let the thing come and attempt to subdue me and help me, Hilda and Bertha and all the rest help me. He stood there before the door, his arms extended, his body rigid. And then the horror that looked like Hilda slowly moved forward. A smile on its lips came closer and closer to him. Touched him, was enfolded in his arms, lips touching lips. And Hans' strong arms flexed. And in turn it embraced him, a smile on its sweetly beautiful face. And as they stood there, the man and, the man and being whose very nature remains an unanswerable question. I pray that the good, that the good overcome evil. The minute, for minutes that seemed hours, they stood there, motionless, treading softly. I moved a step forward, and I caught a glimpse of the thing's eyes. And I was comforted, for I seemed to read in them something of humanity that could not have come from the, to them through guile. I sensed that in truth those others who had been engulfed were fighting on the side of the man, and as I watched, the horror seemed to become frailer and weaker, slowly at first, and then faster and faster. As before my eyes, the semblance of Hilda faded into nothingness, and only Hans remained, holding tightly clasped in his arms a crumpled skirt and blouse, and even yet, for long minutes, Hans did not move, and I sensed that still some metamorphosis went on, some change invisible to human eyes, but at last Hans moved. And looking at the bundle of clothes in his arms as might an awakened sleeper, he struck them tenderly and put them gently down on the table. At last he spoke to me. His voice was the voice of, a, of the man I had known, but immeasurably more beautiful, immensely, immeasurably strong. We worked together, we fought together. Hilda and Bertha, and those unfortunate boys, and Nan, and you, Dr. Kurt, too. We have won. He walked across the floor to the center of the room, and I watched the stout boards give beneath his weight, and yet I can feel the thing inside me like a devilish flame that would eat me if it could. It is in me, and I think that it cannot escape. I pray that it never overcome me and escape. Then he looked at me thoughtfully. 
in the eyes of the town doctor Kurt there's a mystery here Hilda is gone and Burfa Brandt and the Peterson boy so you must go to your home and you must stay and you must say that you have been visiting it visiting to me and that I am insane as for me I will leave a note and go away and the people will believe that I am a murderer and that I have run away I bowed my head silently he spoke the truth he must go away and the world will believe him a butchering maniac for a long time he did not speak but stood there silently his head sunk upon his breast and I thought as he thought then I will walk to your car with you I thank you we all thank you for what you have done probably I shall never see you again he led me from the house then I was sitting in the car the motor running softly while Hans stood there before me in the damp snow he extended his hand goodbye goodbye I said inanely and while yet he stood there in the snow beside the house I drove away thus it is our it is that our village believes that Hans murdered with bloodthirsty abandon and then fearing detection mysteriously disappeared escaped I alone know the truth and the truth weighs heavily upon me and so I have begun to prepare a record of the true happenings in the Brubaker case and presently I shall see that this record is brought before the proper authorities. Meanwhile, I wonder, where and what is Hans? Okay. So this... Okay, this, um... This is a different story by H.P. Lovecraft, but... Yes, for now, I just wanted to show you that story. This is Pulp Fiction. This is very... This is, um... The Pulp Fiction experience, in a sense. Um, this... <laughs> uh, this is a lot different from comic books, but this is what came before comic books. So hopefully, I do wish to do this again, to read more Pulp Fiction books. Um, um, on this channel, more often. It's, it is very interesting. So this is Avon Fantasy Read number six. I will be showing you where to get all of these in PDF format. If you want to buy these in physical form, you basically have to collect them. And, you know, collectors, I mean, these are collectible because they no longer sell these. You basically have to buy, you have to pay hundreds if not thousands of dollars to get copies of these. But honestly, the PDF files are excellent. Um, this is top class writing and it is very um, and I guess this particular image is that is the crawling horror the slime that becomes people so that would be the woman very interesting it, it, is, a, it is a very different experience from comic books and in my opinion is very refreshing to read writing this good and I will just say it you will not find writing this good in comic books. You will not find writing this good in manga. So, this is usually what I read on a daily basis for entertainment. Um, um, pop fiction magazines. Um, so, you know, hopefully some of you will, will decide to sort of add this type of reading experience to, you know, to your list of hobbies basically um, because this is very very the writing is so good and um, it is quite excellent anyhow people may you be blessed and farewell